We're letting Dr. Frank Hollenbeck off his leash once again, and after devouring trade policy on Friday, he's going to sink his teeth into something very different today. Not exactly the Big Mac, but the Big Mac index occasionally released by The Economist based on purchasing power parity. First of all, please can use your expertise to explain PPP. Take, for example, a gold. Suppose that uh, we had gold at a price of $100 uh, in New York. And suppose that the price of gold was 100 euros in, uh, in Europe, let's say in France, and that the exchange rate was 1.3. Well, that can't happen. Uh, the reason that can't happen is I could take $100, go to New York, purchase gold, an ounce of gold, take that ounce of gold, bring it back to uh, Europe, sell it for 100 euros, convert it back into dollars for $130 and make a $30 profit. This is known as arbitrage and uh, it's something I teach my students. I say arbitrage can occur, okay, but it doesn't happen very often and it doesn't happen very long. It's like finding a $100 bill on the sidewalk, okay? It can happen, but it usually doesn't stay there very long. Now, in the case of the example that I just gave you, what would happen is that everybody would be converting $100 into an ounce of gold and buying gold, okay? And going back to uh, Europe and selling the gold and then converting their euros into dollar. What that would do is basically cause the price of gold to go up in, in the US. It would cause the price of gold in euros to go down or it could cause the exchange rate to adjust. Now what usually happens is because the exchange rate, the, uh, I should say the market for foreign exchange is so vast, it's usually the prices that adjust. So what would happen is the uh, price of gold would probably go down to 76 euros so that we have a situation where you take the price of gold in dollars, which is $100, divided by the price of gold in Europe, which is 76, and that's going to be exactly equal to the exchange rate. So in other words, what we can see is that the exchange rate is basically the ratio of the two prices of gold. If we say this for gold, we can also say this for all prices. So a lot of times we talk about purchasing power parity is that the exchange rate is essentially the ratio of prices, the prices in the United States relative to the prices in, uh, in Europe. The problem with this is that we find that in general the exchange rate does not adjust with adjustments in prices in the sense that we can have the exchange rate change 2% and not have prices adjust, prices in the US and prices in Europe adjust by that much. And the reason is, is I made a statement which is not necessarily true. I said we can do this for gold, therefore we do it for all prices. That's not true because not everything can be arbitraged in the sense that I cannot go to New York, purchase a McDonald's hamburger, bring it over to Europe and sell it for euros so that I can make an arbitrage profit. So in the sense that what we have is purchasing power parity is probably only valid for what we call non, uh, for what we call traded goods. And it probably isn't very valid for non-traded goods. In other words, I can't go to uh, New York and get a haircut and then arbitrage it for a haircut in Paris. So that's one of the reasons that you'll find that Purchasing power parity is not a very good concept to uh, reflect changes in price. Uh, the exchange rate doesn't reflect the changes in prices in the short term. But what we find is that when we look at purchasing power parity over maybe 100 years, we find that it does track the differences in prices between two countries relatively well. And the reason is, is that even though we can't arbitrage haircuts between New York and Europe, it is, it is possible that resources will move from Europe to New York in the sense that it's more attractive to work uh, in New York um, cutting hair than it is in Paris. So what, we're say, what we say in economics is that purchasing power parity is a long run concept in the sense that in general we'll find that the exchange rate follows the differences in relative prices but more of a long run basis. 
So how do you take that, you, this theory of arbitrage, and then apply that to burgers, and then come to the conclusion that the Norwegian krona is 60% overvalued? OK. Um, in the example I just gave, if you take 77 euros multiplied times 1.3, you get exactly $100. So if we were to convert everything into dollars, we should have everything be $100. Okay. What we see in the case of the Big Mac index Okay. We see that there's very large differences in the price of hamburgers between countries. We can see that Switzerland has the highest uh, uh, Big Mac index relative to all the other countries and that India is actually the, has the lowest uh, Big Mac price. And the concept of the Big Mac index is uh, one of the strengths of McDonald's is you can walk into any McDonald's and you'll get the same thing. In other words, you can walk into any McDonald's and you, hold, you order a Big Mac, you're going to get the exact same thing. So the Big Mac index is saying is, well, if we take something that's identical everywhere, therefore, when we convert it back into one currency, it should be the same price. This is the problem with this logic is that the price of a Big Mac does not just include the bun, the meat, the cheese that goes into the hamburger. You have to realize that what goes into the cost of the Big Mac is a labor. Okay, and the the uh, price you pay for your rents and uh, the taxation we have on labor. So in other words, the actual cost of a Big Mac, in other words, the actual input costs that go into a Big Mac, most of it has to do with things such as labor costs or paying for rent, et cetera, et cetera. So you can expect that there's going to be big differences between countries. So in, the, in many ways, the Big Mac index is not really a very good guide of what the uh, relative purchasing power is of uh, different currencies or how overvalued or undervalued a currency is because it doesn't take into account these other costs. But it does say something about currencies, which is interesting though, because if you look at the top of the chart, you have the Norwegian krona, the Swedish krona, the Swiss franc. All these are very bullish economies in these uncertain times. So money has maybe flown into these currencies during these uncertain times, maybe made them overvalued, especially in the case of Switzerland, because many people believe the Swiss franc is overvalued. Yes, the um, economy minister just indicated that he thought that the Swiss franc would actually depreciate to a level of 140 and he believed that that was a closer to the actual uh, purchasing power parity of the Swiss franc. And like I said at the beginning, is that it's a long-run concept. In other things, things will work in that direction. What's causing the Swiss franc to be uh, relatively strong or, quote, overvalued, however you define that, is the fact that there's so much turmoil in its, in its neighbor countries, which is uh, the turmoil that's due to the debt crisis, and also the monetary policy that's being followed by uh, the European Central Bank. If you consider that purchasing power parity uh, is a long-run concept and that it does reflect exchange rates, we have to remember that prices are affected by monetary policy. So in other words, if you say that uh, the exchange rate long-term is determined by differences in prices, you're basically saying is that the exchange rate long-term is actually determined by differences in monetary policies. And this goes back to something I said way, way back at the beginning when we did our first interviews, is that the exchange rate is determined by differences in monetary policies and in the market and anticipation of the differences in monetary policy in the future. Thank you, as always, Dr. Frank. Dr. Frank Hollenbeck dispensing invaluable advice, as always. Stay tuned for more interviews and analysis here on Duke's Copy TV. But for now, goodbye.